Hello, Neil. How are you doing this lovely Hello, day? Christopher, I'm very well, thank you. I'm very impressed by your rather fancy looking beats, as the young people say. <laughs> uh, looking fine. Um, hopefully this here is not too distracting. And I have checked to see whether there's anything incriminating on those shelves. And I think there is nothing. So if somebody does play this back and they've like, you know, spotted some sort of, you know, charge yeah. sheet. They, they, might, they might have to zoom in and find something crazy. They there, probably but, will. Thank you, Chris. But, but you have you have your new book that I was I was so fortunate that you sent an advanced copy of the psychology of comedy. So do me a favor and let let these lovely people know like what what inspired you to write this book? Because you're a professor, correct? That's right. Yes, I'm and a professor of psychology. I'm honorary professor of psychology at Regents University London. Mm. Um, I did used to run the uh, psychology department there. Uh, the the book, which is the psychology of comedy. Is, is one that about 20 years ago, I'd have jumped at the chance of writing, uh, but it's the genesis of the gestation of this was not what I was expecting because um, when I originally put a proposal to a publisher, so I've written mm -hmm. quite a few books, and I thought, well, what's the next one? And yeah. I thought, I know what I want to do because I've developed an interest in this profession is horror. So um, mm. I knew a publisher that was doing a particular series, a very nice series called The Psychology of Everything. And they, it is a, the psychology of everything. There are little books on driving and the weather and prejudice. Oh, wow. you know, it's a really interesting set of books from uh, Taylor and Francis Rackledge. So um, the the editor was following me on Twitter and I followed her. Uh, and so I, I sent this email of about five paragraphs of justification about why she should be interested in a book about the psychology of horror. Yeah. And I say, oh, it's, it's, you know, it is the, it's the most successful horror film of all time. Look all the money it's making and these festivals and all the rest of it. And then at the end I said, or oh, I could do <laughs> the psychology of comedy. So you can imagine what happened next. I got an email back from, uh, her name's Kerry, uh, saying, ah, uh, not sure horror would work. The one on comedy though, sounds fantastic. So um, yeah. I ended up doing one on the psychology of comedy because uh, I suppose like most people interested in comedy, um, you, you know, we, we like to laugh. I like to laugh. And yeah. ever since I was very, very young, I had a, a, a real um, professional and meaningful interest in comedy. So when I was growing up, I used to sort of submit these generally awful scripts to TV shows. Yeah. And I'd get, I'd get rejected uh, more often than I was accepted. Um, I did have one joke broadcast on the BBC Radio 1, Steve Wright, in the afternoon, but yeah. I think I was about 14, 15. So it oh. sort of started from there, really, you know, sort of really enjoying comedy. I used to record comedy from TV and the radio and sort of store them on these little you know, cassettes at the time because I'm 150. Um, <laughs> and uh, then that sort of stayed with me until university. And when I did, uh, I intended to study English yeah. uh, at university because... I wanted to be a television critic when I grew up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, I went to a Scottish university and my uh, regent, as he was called, said, well, you have to take three subjects because I've chosen philosophy and English. Mm. And I said, well, what do you do? And he said, I do psychology. I said, well, I'll do psychology then. And then two years after that, decided to move completely into psychology because they knew more about behavior than the English people did. Yeah. Um, and then did my undergraduate thesis on the influence of audience laughter on men mm. and women's response to comedy. And uh -huh. that really is where this all started. Yeah, that's 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 really interesting too, especially because horror was going to be the original one. <laughs> it sounds like comedy has had such a, a huge... Uh, it sort of couldn't be more different, but it says they are quite similar. I mean, there's, yeah. there's a paper which has made comparisons between comedy film and horror film and how mm. the emotions they arouse, although they're a bit different. There are some similarities between them, you know, like we go there because we want to express ourselves in a particular way, either through laughter or fear. You yeah. know, both sort of expressive responses as well as, you know, intellectual ones. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's a little, uh, yeah, it's a little bit yeah. different. It's, it's, it's super interesting because at the time we're, we're recording this, today I released an episode with uh, the sociologist Margie Kerr. I don't know if you've come across her book. It's called okay. Scream, but she dives into some, some of the psychology behind like fear, like, you know, from scary movies to like uh, roller coasters and stuff like that. And, and yeah, I think we need more. So hopefully Rutledge has you come back and do one on, you know, horror too, because I think that'd be super is that, interesting. Is that a book on fear generally then, the Scream book? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, fear, like, yeah, she specializes in researching, like, uh, the psychology behind, like, fear and pain, right. so, so, yeah, so, uh, yeah, check that out, and then you'll know the different no, stuff, no. but, but one thing sure. that you and you and I were talking about, too, was, uh, just about your book on the psychology of comedy, like, I, I didn't know what to expect when I came to it, I, like, I came across it on Twitter, I don't even remember how we, like, cross paths, but I'm like, huh, I like psychology, I like comedy, and I thought it was gonna be kind of like this, like, pop psychology, just like, here, laughing makes you feel better, but you, you go into, like, so many studies and everything, and before we jump into some of that, uh, you, you preface the book, because here's my fear, Here's my fear whenever I come across anything that's like analytical of comedy. It feels like once once you start analyzing it, it's like, okay, cool. Now you just now you just ruined it. Like I don't want somebody to dissect jokes and stuff like that. So how did you kind of navigate? I think you did a phenomenal job navigating that, but like how did oh, you, you while you were writing? Uh yes, you're right. I mean, you know, there's that famous quote from of White's back in 1941. Uh, which I think was the New Yorker saying that, you know, it's a bit like dissecting a frog. Trying to understand or analyze comedy is a bit like dissecting a frog. I mean, it's a very useful theoretical exercise, but in the end, the frog dies. Yeah. So, which is why, and I didn't want it to be that sort of book. I didn't want to be, I didn't want it to be two sorts of books. Don't want to be too negative, but I, I didn't want it to be, as you said, a self-help book. Uh, that was nowhere near my mind. So it's, in, it's interesting that you should say that, you know, yeah. it'd be full of things like run without fun and your stride will falter, which yeah. is a quote from one of these self-help books, by the way. <laughs> um, and I didn't also want it to be, you know, a rather turgid exegesis about the the architecture and the, the mechanics of humour and, mm -hmm. you know, full of you know, fairly abstruse linguistics. I, I wanted it to be really, uh, one, an entertaining book, because it's like a trade academic book, really. So it's for anybody. Um, who has no uh, acquaintance with psychology uh, or comedy, but presumably you like both. So if you like both, you might like the book. Um, and I, I wanted to present what we know at the moment about studies that have been done empirically about one, um, our response to humour and comedy, and why we produce humour and comedy, and how mm -hmm. laughter influences our behaviour, whether it's in the health domain or the well-being domain. Um, or the learning domain or the selling domain, commercial mm -hmm. or whatever. So I, I wanted to do that sort of book really, to bring all these sort of threads together in, in a tiny book. So there's a lot of material that I had to cut out, but I've tried to condense the most interesting stuff into this, you know, fairly short, I think it's like 150,000 words uh, in the, the book. So that was the aim really. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah, it it was exquisite. Like when I when I when I would because I'm usually juggling multiple books that I read so dang much. But when I would pick up yours, like I would go through like chapters because it's so interesting. Like just all these different topics and seeing how you know, like you mentioned, like you know, from teaching to selling to all that. Because I've I've always been like you know, I, I goof around and stuff like that. And and then just like when I got sober, like recovering from addiction, humor was a huge part. Like. Uh, you know, a, a story I don't even think I've mentioned on this podcast, but the first friend I met sober is because we connected over a comedian, right? right. And just that type of humor and stuff like that. And it's when I got, because especially with addiction, a lot of people the, are numbing. What's who's up? The who's the comedian, Chris? Patrice, the, the sadly Patrice O'Neill, he passed away a few years ago. Right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we were talking about uh, we were talking about him. But yeah, it was it was just one of those things because, uh, you know, one of my fears of getting sober was I won't have fun. I won't be able to do that because, okay. you, you know, you use drugs and alcohol and stuff like that. But that showed me that I could laugh. And uh, one thing that I found surprising about just even going to 12 step meetings was people would be telling these awful stories about the stuff we go through, but yeah. laughing about it. I'm like, OK, cool. And I in a second, we're going to go into some of like the theories of comedy. But the first thing I want to kind of discuss without giving away too much of the book is you talk about the differences between male and female humor, right? And there's a lot of, there's a lot of wires that get crossed and stuff like that. But there's also a lot of like commonality, right? Like where, you know, women find, you know, a, a male comedian funny or a men find a female comedian. So can you say, uh, let us know, like, what, what do some of the studies kind of say about the differences between the genders? Well, I mean, this, I suppose, of all the controversial topics in the psychology of humour, um, this is probably the most controversial, but the most <laughs> well studied, um, because, I mean, the headline, depending on how you read it, you know, may, may not be positive, but bear with me. Anyway, it's this. <laughs> um, you've got two things, I suppose. One is the production of humour, and then you've got the enjoyment of humour. 
And are there any sex differences um, in either? And if there are, why should that be? Because, you know, it's not enough to look for, hunt for differences. There has to mm -hmm. be a reason why you'd expect a difference in the first place. Otherwise, it's just a fishing expedition. And of course, what's interesting in the psychology literature is that if you bring together a mass of studies, and, and one uh, meta-analysis did do this, a chap called mm -hmm. um, Gil Greengross and two other authors at Aberystwyth University, meta-analyzed um, studies that uh, examined um, the production of humor and whether the men or women produced more humor and whether they're perceived as being funnier uh, produced by men or women. And you know what they found was, I think from memory, it was about 28 studies, 36 um, individual sets of, of mm -hmm. data, 5,000 participants, huge number. And I mean, what they did find was that 63% uh, of the men um, produced more humor than the average um, number that women produced. So the finding generally was that men tend to produce more humor than do, do women. And mm -hmm. what's interesting is that when you do surveys and you ask people, uh, who do you think is funnier, men or women? Although both clearly are. I mean, it's 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 rather yeah. trite to say that you know men are funnier than women. No, I mean there are funny men, there are unfunny men, there are funny women, there are unfunny yeah. women. But it's interesting that when you ask people who do you think is funniest, invariably they always think that men are funnier. Hmm. And the percentages vary from study to study, but they're very high. I mean, one study found that both about 96% of men and 86% of women thought that men were funnier than women. Um, mm -hmm. That was back in about 2009. There was a more recent study, or 2012, there's a more recent study showing that the percentage um, proportion has stayed the same, but slightly lower. So about 68% think that men are funny, about 34% think that men and women are just the same, and about 7% think that women, right about 7% think that women are funnier than, than men, um, mm -hmm. which, which is interesting, because then you, you think, well, why should that be? Mm -hmm. You know, why, first of all, why do men produce more humor? And that's the evidence. And secondly, why do people think that, you know, men are funnier? Well, they may be perceived as funnier because they produce more humor. Yeah. There's something called, you know, humor uh, production ability, uh, to use the jargon. That's what it's called in, um, you know, psychology. And uh, men tend to exhibit more than this than do women. And one theory is that uh, it's related to evolutionary theory, sex selection. Mm. And it's, um, humor is thought to be a mental fitness indicator. So these are the psychological characteristics, if you like, that attract a mate to another mate. Uh, evolutionary psychology is all about yeah. sex and mating, and we can park that to one side. But what they suggest is that things like, you know, kindness, trustworthiness, intelligence, and humor yeah. are these mental fitness indicators. And by mental fitness, you know, you mean, well, this is somebody who I might want to have a child with. Yeah. You know, and they'll be uh, they'll be uh, tending to my needs and they'll be very thoughtful and trustworthy and give me security and so on and so on. And so it's thought that men are more likely to produce this because women are thought to be more receptive to it, yeah. uh, which is an interesting thought, because if you look at this in practice, um, say Lonely Hearts adverts, I mean, that's the most cliche but obvious example. If you, yeah. When people have studied Lonely Hearts adverts, what they find is that men are more likely than women to state that they have a good sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Whereas women are more likely to say they enjoy uh, laughing and like, would like somebody who could yeah. make them laugh. They're less likely to say, I have a good sense of humor. And in fairness, when you ask men what you'd like in a partner, having a good sense of humor doesn't score very highly uh, for men when it comes to a, a choice of women, but it yeah. does score very highly for women when it comes to choice of huh. men. So I think that's the that's the, yeah. One explanation for why, you know, men, that you have this sex difference in the production of humor in, yeah. um, in men and women. Yeah, it's it's funny. Yeah, as, as somebody who just loves evolutionary psychology, like, you know, I hear that. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. I was actually uh, uh, talking with David Buss, uh, who does all this, oh, yeah. yeah, you know, <laughs> psychological research around like sex psychology and stuff. And I'm like, okay, yeah. So like humor is kind of like the guys like peacock feathers. And, and yeah, you know, you see somebody funny who's like quick witted and, you know, can make, you know, these connections and stuff. And, or, you know, even watching comedians, I think one of the reasons we love comedians is because they have observe things in really interesting ways. And so I could see that as being something guys use to impress. But as you mentioned, it doesn't mean women are less funny, right? You have unfunny on each, but 
yeah, we, I could see guys trying to do it more often to show off and, Hey, look, look at me and impress and, you know, Hey, you, you pick me as a mate. Not only will I produce great kids, but you'll have fun with me and all that. So that's, that's, that's super interesting. Um, so they aside make, from, sorry, they make more attempts at it as well. I mean, they yeah. make more attempts at humor. And since so you mentioned Donald Burst, I mean, he, he did publish one of the in, more interesting studies, which looked at what people find attractive in a mate, you know, mm. and he found that um, a sense of humor was prized highly in women, but not in men, you know, that is a men prized sense of humor less highly in women than women did in, in men. But it, it, to just to sort of, you know, I suppose, finish off this little, it really, I mean, it, the, the sex difference is interesting because it, it can sort of feed into this stereotype that women are not funny, which, you know, yeah. as I said, is clearly not true. And in the yeah. book, you know, I have like a whole paragraph um, of <laughs> yeah. female names where I think, well, look at this brilliant comedian, look at this brilliant bridesmaids made $300 million, oh, yeah. you know, in its, in its opening uh, year. And there's a, there's a very good book by Moena Banks, and I think Amanda Swift, called, um, what's it called? It's called uh, The Joke's On Us, where it begins with a BBC light entertainment producer responding to the book proposal by saying, oh, a book about women's comedy, that'll be short. Mm. You know, so there was this, this was published about 20 years ago. So there was that prejudice, even in, um, you know, the echelons of a, a major um, international broadcaster like the BBC. I mean, I think it's all changed, well, it has all changed now. Um, yeah. But, um, you know the but the, the the data the research still shows this you know sex difference in what people believe uh, about um which sex produces more humor uh, and why yeah yeah that, that's that's really that's really interesting so so humor can help us potentially find a mate i think that's half the that that's half the reason i've ever you know been able to date anybody in my life is because i can hopefully make them laugh sometimes but uh one one thing is to like I want to I want to talk about education, right? You dive into that in the book and you do a little research and and I want you to explain it, but I think about it. Like I would love to have you as a professor because nobody wants like a boring teacher. And when I was working at a, a a drug rehab, when I would be educating people about boring subjects like, you know, dopamine systems and stuff like that, I would try to make it engaging and kind of fun and then like reading your book, I'm like, "Oh, makes sense so can you kind of explain how comedy helps make things click for people and maybe some teachers are listening to this <laughs> well that is an interesting question because the answer to that is we don't know but <laughs> there is some interesting evidence about um whether you should use humor in the classroom so what we do mm. know is that um students do respond more positively to tutors stroke lecturers who do use humor in the classroom as long as it's relevant to the material. If it isn't relevant to the material, their interest plummets. And mm. um, they, they become less bored, but they become, um, they're, they're less satisfied with the nature of the work. And they do less well when they're tested, you know, at the end of the semester or the end of, of the term. Uh, the other thing that students don't like in terms of humor is when the humor is overly negative or too self-effacing. Like uh, and, what? You know, almost self-destructively self-effacing, you know, where the tutor may say, make a joke out of his or her own perceived. Oh, opinion. gotcha, you know, gotcha. They, they don't like that. It, it's interesting, a sort of little sidebar to this. We did some research with colleagues at UCL uh, about whether students prefer lecturers like themselves. And we did find that, yes, students did prefer um, tutors who shared the same personality characteristics, you know, extroversion, openness to experience. Mm -hmm. The one trait they did not appreciate was neuroticism, mm. which is you know, having a sense of, you know, um, extreme anxiety and concern and worry and so on. So if they themselves were high in neuroticism, they didn't like tutors who are high in neuroticism. Uh, the paper is called Birds of a Feather Flock Together, you know, yeah. so um, so yeah, in terms of uh, teaching, there is some evidence to suggest that if you inject humour into your teaching, um, students do perform better in tests at the, the end of the, the semester. There have been some attempts to introduce it into exams, which is probably one of the worst ideas. Yeah, I right. <laughs> Can you imagine being in an exam and you're sitting there and somebody makes a joke out of the, the, the question you've been asked, no, that's not very good at all. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, they didn't do as well. The idea behind that was to see if you could alleviate exam-based anxiety, which is a perfectly Oh, response. okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, misguided in the context of sitting an exam, I would have thought. 
Yeah. So, yeah, there's quite a bit of uh, research on that. The, the other thing that, again, there's some, but not very much, but what there is, um, there are a couple of things you can sort of pick out. One is, you know, what I've just said, that um, use humour, but use it judiciously. Um, mm -hmm. Don't use it all over the place. And around about three or four attempts per hour seems to be like the optimal rate. Um, if yeah. you're joking all the time, the students are not going to learn. They may find it entertaining, but, you know, they're obviously there to learn, you know, and not watch a HBO special. Um, yeah. It's, so, so you as a professor, like, uh, I don't know if uh, diving into research has like helped you out more with like how you teach or anything like that, but you say like you make it relevant uh to the material so can you like can you kind of give an example of something that might happen it like you know in one of your classrooms or like the material and you know i know you don't got the whole session with us but but yeah just so i i, I have something to latch on to uh well i could maybe use three examples actually because i didn't know you were gonna ask me this chris so <laughs> here, here i'm extemporizing on my my sofa um i know one year it was halloween where I was giving mm. a lecture on um, frontal lobes, and my first slide was Phineas Gage. Do you know what Phineas Gage? Yeah, Jack, the, 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 the pole. Shooting. Yeah, yeah. Where are you based in the States, by the way, Chris? I am in Las Vegas, Nevada. Oh, okay. So at the opposite end, if you go to Harvard Medical School, you can actually see Phineas Gage's skull and oh. his ring. So you oh, can wow. see a bit of history over there in Massachusetts. Um, so yeah, I did dress up. As, well, I had a Dracula's cape, so I did dress up as Dracula. Anyway, that's completely irrelevant, but the students <laughs> did like it. So a couple of things I, I do do to make things interesting is I do one lecture on localization of function in the brain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, where do, where do functions reside uh, in each hemisphere if they do? And uh, I, I give them examples of how we are, although we look symmetrical, we're actually mm. quite asymmetrical. So, you know, I say, well, you know, if you took mirror images of the, if you took a left, left and a right, right composite of the face, mm. they would be very different. And, you know, you could do yeah. this yourself. Look in the mirror and do that and just cover your face and then try and do the mirror image. You will look very different with a left, left compared to a right, right composite. So, yeah. you know, I get them to look at each other and I say, well, place a pencil on your nose there and can you see a difference? And sometimes they say, oh yeah, she's got a wonky eye or yeah, that, <laughs> eyebrow, that eyebrow's been badly made up, you know, if they're a bit catty. Um, so I start with this um, and, you know, I say, well, you know, we, we have two nostrils, we have two eyes, we have two ears, but we're not, you know, the, the same. I uh, say, so, you know, women of two breasts, but one is larger than uh, on one side or the other, men of two testicles but one descends lower than the other. So gentlemen, if you could just stand up for a second. <laughs> <laughs> and you could see there's this flicker of recognition where they say, hang on, is he being serious? Yeah. And then like a release, a relief of laughter when they realize I'm not expecting the men to expose themselves in the middle of a, of a lecture theater. Yeah. So you know, I, I, I try and do you know, sort of little things like that. And then uh, there's a session I do on smell and taste where I mm. give them a pheromone and my favorite cologne. And um, the pheromone is androsterone. And this is very famous in chem chemistry world because um, half the population can't smell it. Mm. And the half that do thinks it smells like a gent's lavatory. Right? Okay. So I can't, I'm anosmic to it. So when I prepare it, I have to do it in the toilet because if I spray it and you can smell it, it does stink to high heaven. I mean, it generally <laughs> smells very urinous. So um, that's a little ses session that I do. I have these perfumer strips and I've daubed them with a little bit of androstenone or a little bit of the cologne. And then, you know, hand it around and, you know, they sniff tentatively and they say, oh, that's very nice if it's the cologne. Um, yeah. Uh, Amani's attitude, by the way, if you're interested. You can't <laughs> get it anymore, Chris. Every perfume I like cologne, they discontinue. Really? So if you've got in the United States, bring it over. Oh, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll look the, around. Thank you. With the androstenone, you know, most of them just go, oh, smells chemical because they're smelling the paper. But then mm. the ones that can smell it, which is about 10% of the group normally, I mean, the reaction is just, you know, it's four. I mean, that's the reaction. Huh. You know, so you try and make these things interesting by, you know, introducing a little bit of fun um, into the session. And yeah. they learn, you know, in that way. Yeah, is is this something too, like, I'm, I'm curious. So, you know, I, I don't know. I, actually, you know, there probably is a decent amount of professors who do listen to this because a lot of, you know, authors are like yourself professors, but I'm thinking about like work too, right? Like you have like work training and stuff. Do you think this is something that like employers 
should be kind of like aware of and and and, and stuff like that? Could that help with like training or boring seminars or whatever? Yes, I know, interestingly, because there was one study that looked at um, the perception of male and female managers mm. um, using humor in instructional videos. Now, the videos were fictional, but they had a man and a woman either um, being humorous or not. And what was interesting was that the, the man was perceived as using the humor very functionally. So in exactly the same way that you, you were suggesting that, you know, use the humor to deliver information or deliver, you know, um, um, some training. Uh, the response to the female instructor was not remotely positive. I mean, wow. she was regarded as being less able to do her job because of the use of humor. So, you know, there's, I mean, that's just one study, but I thought it was yeah. interesting, you know, the prejudice that people have about, you know, the use of humor used by, you know, um, certain uh, people. If it's done well, Chris, uh, you're absolutely right. Doing something humorously um, does work. And I, you may or may not know this, but back about 20, 30 years ago, John Cleese um, set mm. up a company where he did exactly this. Oh, really? Uh, made a lot of money out of it. So he and a few of the Monty Python people and a few others um, used to create these instructional videos for company about how to respond to um, people who complain uh, about oh. companies and the right and the wrong way of approaching, you know, um, customer complaints. And they were really funny. You know, yeah. and uh, Griffiths Jones and Mel Smith, they went on and did uh, sort of a similar thing. So done well. I mean, these are these were done by professionals. Yeah. So done well. They're brilliant. I do remember vividly, though, one way it went really badly where it was uh, I just started this job and, and we, we were all given a raft of HR training about various things. I was managing at the time yeah. and they started with a clip from the, the British um, office. Um, which involved uh, an appraisal being done by um, David Brent and one of his employees. Yeah. Uh, and they just showed this clip with no context, you know, and it was meant to say, oh, isn't this amusing? This is how not to do an appraisal. And you're oh. sitting there thinking, well, yeah, we sort of know this because it's the office and the office is known for putting people in terrible situations that shouldn't happen. Yeah. You know, so I was using humor, I, I thought in a way that was, um, not the best and in a fairly, you know, cack handed way. Yeah. So yes. I, that, that's, you know, an, another thing. So I, since we're talking about this, like, you know, whether it's in a classroom or at work or, you know, wherever it is. And, and I, you've, you've, you've seen how kind of like, I don't know, it seems like over the last 10 years or whatever, the climate's kind of changed. Right. So I'd imagine that there are many people afraid to make certain jokes and things like that. And, and things evolve over time. Like some jokes that didn't use, they, they were okay and now they're not okay. But anyways, like uh, you you cover this in a book, like offensive humor. And and I do want to talk about some of the, the theories around humor, but like, since we're on this topic, how, how can people kind of navigate this? Like people need to read the book, but like if, if you had to give somebody like a tip, like for navigating the workspace or if they want to bring humor into the classroom without getting written up or, you know, whatever it is, how, how do we navigate that offensive humor? Well, it's, uh, the honest answer, it's really hard, which is why <laughs> some employees, employers shy away from it because even the most innocuous comment may be perceived very innocuously or noxiously yeah noxiously probably so you know you have to be real unless you're, you're being blandly amusing which mm -hmm. is fine um you know it's it's best to steer away from you know some things you know deliberately because um yeah causing offense is a, is a is a big thing and it is all in the the eye of the beholder you know whether you you're meant to be offensive or not be offensive yeah if somebody takes offense then you know there's a likelihood they may be you know complained about it you know some people have more liberal views than you know than others and just think oh actually that's that's quite amusing um mm -hmm. and i've been in situations where i thought well that's that's not quite i mean i'm quite liberal minded as you could imagine right? yeah but, you know, i was thinking ah that's a little bit near the knuckle and maybe you should have ranged yourself in a little bit there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's tough. I'm not sure if it's getting tougher. Um, I mean, it's, I talk in the book about a particular TV show called uh, Brass Eye, mm. uh, which was a spoof news program on channel four in this country. And they did a spoof episode about pedophilia, mm -hmm. but it wasn't about pedophilia. It was about the press's response to pedophilia. Mm. So basically, it was satirizing 
the media's response to this, um, you know, this horrible crime, not, not the crime itself. But people got very angry because they thought they're mocking, you know, um, children being abused, which was mm -hmm. not a joke at all. Charlie Brooker was one of the writers. Chris Morris, who did mm -hmm. Three Lines, was the, the, the presenter. And at the time, well, until last year, your last year, it was the most complained about programme on British television because it was so offensive to some people. Really? Um, it was superseded last year by complaints about the coverage of the death of the Duke of Edinburgh mm. <laughs> because people thought there was too much of it. So um, people were offended in a different way. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, about something entirely different in a different context. Yeah. So, yeah, ca causing offence, but then sometimes causing offence is justified, for example, if you're being satirical. So, you know, sometimes the point of creating something offensive is to try and change uh, the way of thinking or to ridicule something mm -hmm. you think is actually either dictatorial or offensive um, or uh, injurious in, in some way, which is mm -hmm. why, you know, politicians are the, tend to be the subject of, of satire and religious leaders tend to be, you know, the subject of satire. And of course, the consequences, seriously, can be really bad. You think of Charlie Hebdo, um, you know, the, the satirical French magazine, um, uh, which was um, a number of its staff were, were murdered by, you know, yeah. extremists who didn't like um, their representation of particular faiths. You, you know, so sometimes um, it can attract the responses of extremists as well as people who aren't extreme but just don't like what you say. Um, after all, I mean, there is no balance here. Yeah, there yeah, no yeah it's. Balance. Yeah, it's something where it's like I've I feel like I I've had to learn like since I've always goofed around like you know there's lessons I learned like you know when I was a child and getting a little bit older and you know just my age and then uh, you know how the world changes around me and stuff and you know when the best thing I've learned like when it comes to like work uh, or other atmospheres that could be professional it's like you know knowing the context getting to know people and just kind of having that overall awareness but it could be this fine line and like you said too it's like the perception matters too and that's that's difficult that that, that could be difficult sometimes but personally i just try to like take a step back and be like okay what was their intent were they trying to be funny were they trying to be offensive like what what was it but but yeah that that's a good segue into some of these theories right so that was one of my favorite parts of the book where you like broke it down i'm like ooh, ooh, this is interesting so like uh a couple that i just dotted down on my notes like i wrote down like the superiority theory freud that that guy had all sorts of wacky views about you know certain things but uh but yeah can you can you kind of give like a brief overview of some of the theories that you discuss in the book book right like because you know it made me think about people who use humor to you know show status and put other people down yeah, and absolutely. you know and there's all these all these different kind of reasons so yeah i would love to hear a little bit well, yeah that. sure um, yeah listen thanks for that chris um i mean most theories of we call them theories of comedy and humor but really if you if you look at them they're actually theories of laughter mm. i mean why do you produce laughter and what's the purpose and um it, rather than theories of comedy you know, per se. And I mean, there are loads of theories. I mean, there are tens of them. But I suppose if the, the, there are four or five, I suppose, what you might call big general theories of, of, of humour. And uh, one of them, touching on what we just talked about, is superiority um, mm -hmm. theory. Um, and this is the, and this is tied to disparagement humour, which is, you know, sort of what we were just talking about, really, uh, which is this idea that we we um, generate laughter, we use comedy in order to belittle others mm -hmm. and to establish our own superiority and so social or physical status as well. So it, in a sense, it, it sort of has a malicious you know, purpose. Um, it's quite an old one, this one. I mean, Plato was one of the first people to you know, touch on this as a, as a theory. And, and then you've got, you know, you've got the triumvirate, you've got all of them, uh, Plato, Socrates and Aristotle, more or less, thought the same thing about the use of laughter and humor. That is, it was not a good thing because it indicated what a what a, an unpleasant person you are, because yeah. um, it, it's, it's all about demonstrating your own purity and integrity and competence and belittling someone else or someone else's or something else's purity, integrity, mm -hmm. and confidence. I mean, Aristotle, um, call people who made people off vulgar buffoons. Yeah. Can you imagine such a thing, Chris? Vulgar buffoons. The comedy industry would die out if, uh, if that was the case. Yeah. Um, 
and then um, you had, so, so that was the ancient view of, you know, um, laughter. Then I suppose that's the, the, uh, the most well-known advocate of this theory a little bit later, so 17th century was uh, Thomas Hobbes, mm. um, who um, described something called the sudden glory. So the laughter was the sudden glory of recognition that you've established your own um, competence and um, seniority and authority compared to somebody else's. You know, it was a way of us of saying, you know, I'm better than you. Yeah. And he said, this is why we use laughter. That's the purpose of laughter to, to demonstrate this superiority. And it sort of runs through, you know, we talked about offense a few seconds ago. It runs through some really famous types of jokes as well. So if you think of, you know, the subjects, I suppose objects would be the most mm -hmm. better way of putting it, the object of, of jokes, they tend to be either based on sex or race uh, or political party sometimes, usually though an out group, you know, not a member of our own in group, but a, a group that we either dislike or is different to us. Um, and, and that's the butt of the joke. So the mm -hmm. very famous example is, you know, in America, um, at, at one point, the anti-Polish jokes, you know, were very common. And even within, you know, um, uh, the states itself, you know, New Yorkers make jokes about other other states, you know, like uh, like the Midwest states. Um, yeah. Uh, in, the, in the UK, you know, the very famous example is um, uh, Irish people or Scottish people being mean, Irish people being not very bright, or Welsh people, and uh, I'm a Welsh person, being obsessed with fornicating with sheep, right? So you've... Uh, there's the, uh, there is a very funny joke, which I'll tell you. You can cut this out if you like, <laughs> which is this, right? So it's, it's a joke against my nation, Chris, so bear with me. Um, I, I'm allowed to say this. Uh, and the joke is, uh, what do you call a sheep tied to a, tied to a lamppost in Wales? A leisure centre, right? The idea <laughs> that, you know, the Welsh are obsessed with fornicating with ungulates, right? Um, and then you've got the blonde joke is sort of universal in Western cultures. Yeah. And can be specific to countries as well. So in the UK, we've got in so-called Essex girls jokes, mm. which are more or less blonde girl jokes, but, you know, translocated to a specific county. And, you know, there are tons of those. And again, without wanting to be too offensive, but I'll give you one example, um, which I think I did put in the book so I can say which is, you know, how do you get a one-armed woman out of a tree, a one-armed blonde woman out of a tree? Yeah. Wave at her. You know, the idea being that she's so dim that somebody's waving and she waves and she falls down the tree and she hurts herself. You know, so there are these, you know, traditional butts of jokes um, that are, you know, very offensive, actually. You know, in some yeah. cases, if you are Irish, Scottish, Welsh, blonde, yeah. Domestic, Polish, and blah, blah, blah. So when when did people when did it kind of like transition where they were like oh we can have humor to make other people have fun or whatever it is because there was one book i was reading i can't remember if it was robin hansen's book the elephant in the brain but one of the theories i think i heard was like laughing is a way of saying like you know uh we're playing around right so like if you're wrestling i'm laughing it's hey i'm not serious i'm not really trying to fight you so so they they that was kind of signaling like hey this is okay this we're just here to have fun so when did people start to realize that hey maybe this is it for like always nefarious reasons because there's still people who use humor as a way to put people down or you know uh uh you know just be cruel but yeah when when did they start saying like oh maybe we can have fun with this we're well, threading back to what you said earlier as well I mean, a use of you know you ask well, can we use humor in a work context well of course you can because it's used to break the ice and that's mm -hmm. one of the one of the main uses of humor in um a non-social social context by that i mean you know you're with people you don't really know but it's still a social context like a work environment or a meeting you know and breaking the ice with a joke is a brilliant way of getting people relaxed you know yeah. it's, it diffuse the situation and maybe provide some relief if people are feeling quite tense um in terms of when things changed i think things sort of overlap because superiority theory is just one i mean the, the other big one is incongruity which, well, actually, before I go on to that, you talk about playfulness. There is one theory that is specifically about playfulness, mm. um, and that is um, um, Apter's uh, reversal theory. And Apter suggested this. He suggested that, well, during the day, we, we actually go in and out of two different states, the 
paratelic state and the telic state. And the paratelic state is our playful state, mm. where we're very receptive to laughter and, you know, a bit of wrestling, um, Chris. Um, don't ask me to wrestle. I'm not <laughs> too far away. <laughs> too far away. Uh -huh. I can arm wrestle, you know that. No <laughs> virtual arm wrestling. Um, whereas the telic state is when we're much more serious, but we're very goal-directed. And these two um, are sort of oppositional. So they don't you know, overlap at all. But we do sort of dovetail and, and between these two things. Mm. He says, doing this, like tells the unexpected. We, we do do that during the, the course of the day. So that again is another sort of theory of, of um, humor. But going back to the incongruity theory, I mean, this, this is a big, very interesting theory that does explain a lot. An incongruity theory is the idea that we laugh at things because we two, see two things go together, juxtaposed together that shouldn't go together. Mm. You know, it's like an oxymoron, and that's the joke. Yeah. Um, and and a lot of humor is about drawing this, you know, incongruity. A lot of visual humor is about, um, you know, incongruity. Uh, one of my I mean, one of my favorite cartoons is uh, two firemen have turned up, and there's a cat, and the cat has a tree trunk stuck up stuck up its bottom, and one fireman says to the other. Well, I suppose a tree up a cat makes a change. You know, the idea <laughs> being that normally a cat is stuck up a tree in the fire. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so the, and there are lots of examples of this in TV and film comedy as well. You know, this incongruity. I mean, um, Airplane, I mean, is like stuffed. Oh, yeah. Sort of incongruous, you know, you know comedy uh, examples. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so those are two. So that's, that's one of the playful ones. You mentioned Freud. I mean, Freud's theory doesn't sort of hold much traction these days. Yeah. Pretty typical of much of, you know, Freudian psychoanalytic theory just generally, I think. But, you know, Freud argued that, that we use jokes in order to express things that we are prevented from expressing normally. Mm -hmm. um, and those jokes tend to be sexual or aggressive. And we can express our sexual and aggressive urges via the medium of jokes. Um, yeah. and make those um, feelings acceptable. You know, there's not much evidence for this, uh, by the way. But you know, um, as with Freud, everything is about. Yeah, sex. yeah, he was probably doing a lot of cocaine when he came up with that theory. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, like there's also kind of this this social aspect, and I and I, one of the questions I've been dying to ask you, while I had you here, is you you dive into laugh track. So so let me yeah. let me let me tell you something that bothers me real quick, Neil. There's. There's people who dissect the frog, if you will, right? Uh, maybe it's because I come from a YouTube background, but uh, they'll they'll take like Big Bang Theory or Friends or some of these famous shows, and they're just like, look how look how unfunny this is with a laugh track. And first off, that makes me want to put a hole in the wall because like like the whole structure would be different if they weren't waiting for the laugh track. You know what I mean? Like, of course, it's gonna make it awkward if you pull this out it's just going to be a gap but anyways anyways uh the guy who like invented the laugh track he made like a bajillion dollars and stuff but can you kind of can you kind of explain like this kind of social like uh i can't remember if this has something to do with like mirror neurons or what but why why did they use laugh tracks you just say mirror neurons yeah Chris, like we mimic each other and about aromatherapy next but well <laughs> <laughs> well there's this, there's this idea that laughter is contagious you know the contagion of laughter that is true mm -hmm. Um, but the interesting thing is, well, what happens if you sort of add laughter to, say, a piece of comedy that is either funny or not funny? You know, would you laugh more to an unfunny joke if there was laughter added than mm. if you listen to an unfunny joke without the, the laughter? Uh, which is a very interesting question. Yeah. Um, we have kind of laughter, by the way. I think it was Time magazine back in 1999 who said this was the worst idea ever created, which... It is, but only because it's used badly. Mm. Uh, can laughter used well can actually make a comedy uh, be perceived as funnier and can actually make people laugh. And this is the key thing. If the laughter seems natural, then people tend to laugh more when they're listening to or watching comedy. And the, what's interesting is they also tend to find it funnier, even though objectively, you know, there's no difference between comedy with or without laughter. They yeah. tend to find comedy funnier if it's accompanied by audience laughter. And that was the basis of my um, undergraduate thesis, because mm -hmm. um, at the time there was, um, there was a sitcom um, um, by, do you know Ben Elton, uh, mm -hmm. British stand-up comedian, 
um, he he had, he did Queen the Musical. That is. Oh, um, okay. Uh, he wrote the lyrics for Queen the Musical. I say lyrics. Queen wrote the lyrics. You know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, um, I get it. He's a very successful novelist, and um, you know he co-wrote Black Adder, which you, you may know, um, and The Young Ones, and so on. Um, so he he wrote his first sitcom as a solo writer because he'd written with other people before, um, called Happy Families. And it's produced by a man called Paul Jackson, very famous British TV producer. And it sort of bombed, really. And Jackson said, well, you know, people complained that there were no jokes in it, uh, a bit like the people, on, you know, you describe on YouTube. But he's saying, well, it was stuffed with jokes, but there was no laughter track to signal them in. Yeah. And I thought, well, well, that's an interesting idea. So basically what he's saying is the laughter acts as a sort of marker telling you that this is a joke and it's funny. So what I, I did was, I mean, I set up a, an experiment to see whether um, you could test this hypothesis. So I took um, a radio series, a topical radio series, and I took the jokes that received more audience laughter in the live show, because it was a live show. Uh -huh. I was broadcast Radio 4, Saturday evening. So I did a bit of editing, and then I presented men and women, because that was the other thing I was looking at. People had said, oh, women laugh more, and they find comedy funnier when there's laughter accompanying comedy and I was a bit mm. skeptical because the literature was a bit up and down. Um, so I asked them to listen to this either with or without the audience laughter. Mm -hmm. And we found two things. One, that the audience laughter accompanying the sketches and the jokes did make people laugh more. So I had a video camera, you know, recording their laughter, I had a, an audio tape uh, cassette recording their laughter and I was doing a lot of measuring and yeah. um, very interesting. So that happened. Also, they found the comedy funnier when mm. it was accompanied by laughter. Um, the second thing is there was no sex difference. So both men and women laughed more and they found the comedy funnier when it was accompanied by laughter. And the way I've tried to explain it is by saying that, a um, bit like what Jackson was saying you know, anecdotally, is that the, the laughter um, tells you that there is something funny here. Yeah. But again, it comes down to how well that laughter, if it is inserted, is actually inserted. If it's done really badly, it just looks like a badly edited piece of. Film. Yeah, yeah. The way the way I've kind of always seen it is, I don't know. You got to kind of put yourself in a scenario. Like if you've like if you've ever been friends with somebody and they introduce you to somebody else that they know that you don't know, and they say something, and depending on their their relationship you don't know if they are saying something mean to them or they're joking with them so the laugh is a signal like oh okay this scene i get it now you two are messing with each other and stuff like that and and sometimes you need that because you're like oh crap should i be taking this seriously do i need to watch out for these two people to start fighting or, or whatever that's kind of how i've always viewed like laugh tracks but like you said too like has to be done you know, well, right? But I could imagine a writer too, if they've had a certain type of writing that they've done and then they try to do comedy. And if you don't have anything to really signal that, people are used to what they've already done in the past. And you gotta, you gotta kind of have some kind of signal for this like tone shift and all that. But, but Neil, I don't have much. Oh, much, sorry. No, no, I, was gonna... I, I was just gonna say, I, I don't have much more of your time, but I do, I do wanna hear what you were about to say. And then I, I want to conclude by asking you some stuff about some comedians, if that's oh, all right. Yeah, right. What, what a build up, right. Yeah. Hopefully it's worth it. So you're saying <laughs> about, you know, the use of laughter is well, it's like a social ungu and a social oil. And of course, that is one of the uses of laughter to make people uh, place them at their ease. You know, sometimes we use it for other things as well, like trying to, you know, suck up to the boss. So we will laugh yeah. at very unfunny jokes because we think, oh, this is the right thing. Uh, you know, to to do. So, you know, laughter has, you know, different uses, um, you know, in different contexts. That's what I was going to say. Oh, no, definitely, definitely. <laughs> but, but yeah, like, uh, something that I've, I've been curious about for a while. And, and I think you'd say it in the in the book, you, you have a whole deep dive on like comedians and stuff. But uh, I've, I've always felt like, like, there's this, there's this thing, right, where, you know, if they do a documentary about a comedian or whatever, or, you know, you have just comedians who have, uh, you know, um, taken their own life, like Robin Williams and stuff like that, there's this idea that they're, they're more depressed, but you say like, the, the research is kind of sketchy around all sorts of stuff around comedians. But what what kind of explanation is there like are comedians more prone to depression or do depressed people more likely get into comedy like i i i think a lot of people are really curious about that 
Yeah, there have been some researchers that have tried to sort of examine, I'll well, try to answer this question. It's a really tif difficult one to answer, but from what we do know, we, we sort of know this really from the limited literature, right? We know that um, there's very little that is common in the backgrounds of successful comedians. Now, these hmm. are professional comedians, not amateurs. I mean, the, the, the most the most commonly uh, discovered trait that they all share is, in a sense, low socioeconomic status. Mm. And that it, it, uh, when they were sort of growing up. So they came from a family, you know, that was not relatively well off. And that sort of makes sense, really, because there are very few what you might call aristocratic uh, comedians, you know. And there's one view that, you know, a lot of comedy is born out of hardship. And, you know, it's a way of dealing with that hardship. I mean, Razam Barr is a fantastic example mm. where you know, she admits that a way of avoiding being punched or hit by her family was to make them laugh. Oh. So for her, it was very much, you know, a way of, of surviving in a way. And, you know, Razam produced a, a very, um, you know, influential so-called middle class um, sick or middle class in the States means, of course, something slightly different here. Um, the... The notion that they are more depressed than, say, other artists. I mean, there's no real research for that either. There are, there are individual pockets of research that suggest that they score more highly on depressiveness scales. Mm -hmm. what, what there is evidence for is to suggest that if you give them personality measures, and there's a very big one in psychology called the Big Five, um, and it measures ocean, openness to experience, um, conscientiousness, extroversion, uh, what do we have? We have neuroticism and OCAM and agreeableness. Yeah, I mentioned Wait, that. Oh, we do that. Yeah, it's a, very <laughs> it's a very important one because that's the one almost every study shows comedians score uh, more, uh, not as highly as other people on. So they're, mm. they're less agreeable according to these scales. But they're also more extrovert and more open to experience as well. So, you know, swings and roundabouts. Um, some studies find that they also score more heavily on the neuroticism um, trait as well. Mm -hmm. But the one consistent finding is this, you know, agreeableness. Um, so it feeds into this notion that, you know, uh, comics are, you know, fairly solely disagreeable melanic dark characters and of yeah. course there's something called the dark tetrad which i know we haven't touched on which i know you wanted to but maybe for another time we can talk about the dark tetrad and its yeah. relation to the use of aggressive humor uh, you know in particular yeah yeah we, we so, might also, we, they don't tend to die the, the other thing is people are interested in whether comedians die more quickly, mm. uh, more quickly. <laughs> die sooner not more quickly that's ridiculous um die sooner than others and uh, again there's no evidence for this uh, uh, either yeah yeah and we, we we might have to do a follow-up but like one of the things i was going to ask you about that you end on you in the book with it saying how many things you didn't have the time to squeeze into this book or would have been even you know longer but yeah there's there's definitely enough that you said to make another book but one thing one thing last question last question i promise but on the topic of comedians, this this might not even have to do with psychology, or maybe it does because everything has to do with psychology. But uh, there's you know there's been this growing thing and conversation amongst comedians about how like comedy's dying because everybody's so sensitive and you can't say anything and all these all these other things. Here's my personal opinion, right? Uh, and it it depends, but I'd say eighty to ninety percent of the time, I'm like comedians get a pass, right? Because you don't know, you don't know what's going to land, what's going to make people laugh, what's going to make people offended. Like you mentioned with that, that satire and the, you know, people interpreted it in a way it wasn't the intention. So I'm just curious your thoughts of, you know, it's 2021, like, should comedians have like a little bit more wiggle room? Or do you think that they need to change and be more mindful of, you know, the climate? Or I'm curious what you think about that, since you study all this stuff. Well, I mean, it, it's still going on. I mean, there are some areas that are thought to be, you know, like verboten, you know, and, and not, not to be broached under any circumstance. And I suppose in a sense, this is this is right in a way, you know. Um, but if you, you think of Sasha Baron Cohen and Borat, I mean, that that is a, a comedy that trades mm. very heavily on embarrassment and very heavily on almost offence. I mean, especially the earlier films, you know, particularly, were yeah. you know, very, very, very sort of, you know, near the, the, the knuckle. I mean, one, I think the sort of joke you wouldn't be able to get away with now is uh, one that I talk about in the book, but it's by Alan Zweibel, 
who co-wrote um, um, It's Gary Shandling's show, you know, and was uh, Saturday Night Live. And he, he, they, they were, one of the sketches they were going to do for SNL was, can you come up with the worst Hanukkah present? Mm. And Alan Swivel's joke was uh, a drum kit for Anne Frank. You know, so if you think it through, it's a, it's a very funny joke, but it, yeah. was, it was perceived to be insensitive even at the time when he was working at SNL. You know, so there are some things I think, you know, people naturally sort of shy away from. Uh, and sort of, in a, in a sense, rightly, you know, making jokes about people's race, for example, you know, people are not bright or not this or that simply because of the color of their skin is, yeah. is, is nonsensical. And I don't think you get much traction, um, you know, generally for, for that sort of humor. So I think people are sort of shying away from from that, there's been a sort of, you know, a revolutionary in the way of comedians think about the sort of subjects they think are important. So now they will focus on things like, you know, social injustice um, or, mm. um, or, or satirizing the powerful, you know, like Donald Trump, you know, mm -hmm. for, for example. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. It's it's such a it's such a weird situation. I don't know what it is, and yeah, I, I try to just you know analyze myself. But when I, when I look at stuff, I'm always thinking about like intent, right? You could tell when there's there's people where it's like the the superiority thing, right? You could tell it's like you are saying something mean to try to put this person down, and like that is nowhere near funny, right? But then yeah, then there's it depends on which one it is, like because there's sometimes where it's that that two conflicting ideas, like you said right like and that's where we get the humor from and it, it's it's all really weird i'm glad i don't got to make decisions about who gets to you know do comedy and who doesn't but if you do well though it's brilliant you think of ricky gervais's golden globes um intro oh yeah stuff, right where he really lays into the celebrities with some very funny jokes yeah um, you know i like a drink as much as the, as the next man unless the next man is mel gibson you know that sort of it's funny, uh, yeah. but it's very, very sharp and very near the knuckle, and it's offensive to the people involved. And some people did get very offended. Offended. Robert Downey Jr. was, you know, famously, you know, ruffled by some of the comments that Gervais made, mm. you know, doing that. But I think they're perceived as fair game because you know they're the yeah. rich celebrities and they have power. I mean, they they can they can do uh, you know equal comedic damage to Gervais if they wanted to. You know? yeah yeah depends, exactly depends on context you're right depends on context yeah yeah it's really interesting and 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 i'm sure there's somebody who can break it down and like take the data and stuff but then we're dissecting the frog again you know what i mean so some people like to basically just got to get as close as possible and, and see what happens but but yeah but yeah the we're... frog alone is what we're saying Chris. <laughs> alone. exactly so uh we're recording this right before your book comes out but can you let everybody know and because we didn't even touch on all the topics and you <laughs> a thousand more so when's the book come out where can people get it and where can people keep up with you your work and uh when we pressure you into writing a follow-up book or the book on horror so so yeah let us know where we can find it and where we can find you yeah you, you can be my agent chris yes the next <laughs> book on horror. um so um the the book is the psychology of comedy it's published by Ratledge, Taylor Francis. It's out on the 18th of August. Um, you can get it on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, uh, the publisher's website, if mm. it's anywhere, Waterstones. Do you have Waterstones in the States? I don't think you do. You've got Barnes & Noble, though, haven't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so you can find it there. Um, the hardback is eye-wateringly expensive, so don't go anywhere near the hardback. Oh, yeah, we were looking at that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, It's not even a nice cover, Chris. You think for that price, it's yeah. 111 pounds, which is about like $200. You think I'll yeah. give you a nice cover. But the uh, the paperback has, you know, a very nice red nose on it. Uh, it's about 12 pounds, which is what, $17, I imagine? 17, Something 20. like that. I think that. we're close. And uh, yeah, if you want to get in touch with me, let me know what you think of the book. If you've got it, I'd be delighted to hear from you. Um, I'm on Twitter at uh, that Neil Martin, N-E-I-L-M-A-R-T-I-N. And I'd love to hear from you if you've got the book. Yeah, I, I, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's how we got in touch. You are very communicative on Twitter. So I'll link all that stuff down below. So Neil, thank you so much for doing this. It's like, thank you. Yeah, it's like nighttime for you and mid afternoon for me. But yeah, so, but yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch and we'll probably do this. Can I say as well how impressed I've been by all these podcasts that you're doing, right? And all the reading. I, I think I, in an email, I described it as being like a bibliophage, right? You just eat <laughs> these books. I've never known anybody read as many books. You see these things here, that'll probably take you like a week. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's my trick. My trick is audiobook. 
it's all audio and I just listen all day long, but yeah, I just, I consume it. But yeah, I'll, I'll give you some of my tricks sometime. But yeah, Neil, thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Thank